Ah, happy fourth to you. You know, I, I'm not sure if you're anything like me. Uh, you probably have a tendency, occasionally at least, to watch the news. <laughs> and maybe it's like it does for me. It drives you a little bit crazy, right? Uh, and if you're short on information, you're certainly not short on opinion because everybody's got one, right? And the whole political scene today really is very frustrating. Um, I think to every one of us, because the debate is, of course, um, Republican versus Democrat, conservative versus liberal or progressive, whatever word you want to use, big business versus small business, too much tax, not enough, who's rich, who's not. And then the ultimate underlying question is why? Why is there so much debate about all this? Um, and the debate, it really kind of gets very emotional. It's very multifaceted. There's a lot to it. It's very complex, as you all well know. Uh, but I think there really is another debate that is really going on underlying all this, behind the scenes, that we really need to talk about. And I have chosen since July 4th fell on Sunday to do that today. Um, and the reason I think that we need to talk about it is because every once in a while, the life of a nation intersects, certainly this is true of the United States of America right now, intersects uh, with Scripture. And uh, when a political or public or social issue intersects with Scripture, then people who do what I do uh, need to say something. Uh, because it's part of our responsibility that God has given us. And we need to take it seriously. So here's what I'm going to do today. I, I'm going to unveil to you what is at the heart of the issue. And I really want you to put on your thinking cap and think about this a little bit as a Christ follower. Because the heart of our issue is our national conscience. Our national conscience. Now everybody knows what a conscience is. We all have one. Our conscience is that thing inside of us that informs us of what we should and what we should not do, right? And you aren't sure where you learned that, maybe. You couldn't pinpoint it. But you know that you should do them, and you think other people should do this as well because you do it. And that is your conscience, and we all have one. We all have part of that. One thing about a conscience is that it's like that small, still voice, and us as Christians, as Christ followers, we believe that God speaks to us through His Holy Spirit that he works through our conscience, and that little voice speaks to you, and when it does, you've got a couple of options. You can listen to that voice, and you can adjust your life to it, or you can uh, ignore it, and eventually you'll numb it. You can wear calluses on your conscience like you can on your fingers and hands, to the point that you don't feel things anymore. I'm going to be very short on Scripture today, but it's very pointed. And I want you to take heed. Paul wrote a passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 that made a prediction that we're living in. I want you to hear what he said. He said, the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, clearly says that in latter times... Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, I really want you to let that resonate with you for a moment. Consciences seared as with a hot iron. Now, what we don't think about is this. Every individual has a conscience, but there's also such a thing, and we have it here, called a collective conscience. I don't know if you've ever given that much thought. You have a collective, collective conscience with regard to your family, for example. There are just things that your family does in confines of your home and household, and there's things that you don't do, you, but you know what is expected. That is your family collective conscience. We have it in families, we have it in businesses, we have it in schools, we have it in nations. Nations have collective consciousness. Now, here's an example of that. This is just a brief one. Throwing trash out your car window on the road, we all have come to understand that is not right. I'm not saying we don't 
do it occasionally with something small, but we know that it's not right. My question is, is how do you know it's not right? Because I've been in third world countries that they don't know that it's not right. So how do you know that, that it's not right? Well, you say, well, it's against the law. But we break the law all the time. Most of you broke it coming to church today. Right? So where does that idea come from? Well, in the United States, our conscience is in tune uh, uh, with regard to litter as part of our national conscience. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of things here that are quite a bit heavier than litter that have shaped our national conscience. And uh, you never think about your family or a group or national conscience, I don't think, until you're really exposed to something that's very contrary to it. Because a conscience is just kind of how we operate. It's, it's kind of what we do. We take it for, for granted and we say things like this. Here's what people should do and here's what people should not do, right? Or doesn't everybody know and then we finish it? Or can't everybody just understand which is why I said at the beginning, we may, not, we may be short on information, but we're not short on opinion, right? It's just the way that we think life ought to work. And uh, we're often unaware that we operate that way, but we do operate that way. I want to give you some examples of that in the United States. The anti-slavery movement in England and in the United States was fueled by conscience. Uh, there were laws uh, that enforced how slavery was to be handled. And when you read about the abolition movement, eventually it was the conscience of England and the United States that people finally realized, hey, we have ignored our common sense long enough. This is wrong to treat human beings this way. And as a result, it was a war and it was an issue of conscience that turned that around, okay? The civil rights movement, same thing. The civil rights movement was a movement of conscience. The civil rights leaders, both black and white, appealed to the American conscience and said, it should not be this way. And civil rights leaders, including many ministers, spoke into the issue of our national conscience. And consequently, laws and regulations were changed because of conscience because their America had a heart change is the reason that laws were changed. Currently our laws govern abortion are all conscience laws. I don't know if you're aware of that or have given it much thought. Our national conscience right now has become that abortion is morally acceptable in our country. But our laws will not permit a young woman to have a baby and two hours later throw it in a dumpster if she doesn't want that. And collectively, as a country, we go, no, 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 that, that's wrong. You shouldn't, shouldn't do that. And my question is, based on what? What's that, what's that wrong based on? And again, when abortion is allowed, and it's not a matter of science, we're not following the science on it, because science knows when life begins, proved time and time again, it's a conscience issue. It's what we have agreed that is consciously acceptable. Same is true with same-sex marriage, and we could go down the list. And as our public conscience shifts, and as it moves back and forth, laws, regulations, and statutes follow, and sometimes they get overturned, and sometimes they don't. Child pornography laws would be another example of this. It's a conscience issue. We just think it's wrong. And if it, you don't think it is, I guess speak up. <laughs> we just think it's wrong that there be such a thing as child pornography. Right? Here's my question. Why do we think it's wrong? Who told us that? Who taught us that? Well, I don't know it's how we got it. We just know it's wrong. Well, how do you know it's wrong? I don't have to know that, Sammy. It just is. See, that's... That's how the conscience works. Well, here's another example. We think it's wrong for adult men to marry 11-year-old girls. My question is, is why? Well, isn't it obvious? Well, it's obvious to us. It's not obvious to everybody around the world, right? 
because it's part of our national conscience. It's, it's not that obvious to other cultures that I've been in on mission outings and so forth. Child labor laws is another conscious issue. We say it's human rights. But at the same time, the, the shift here is, which this is interesting, child labor, we're against child labor, but the shift has been in our national conscience that while we're against child labor laws, we will allow children to choose their own gender. Again, who says what's right and who says what's, what's wrong? How do we arrive at a collective consciousness about these things? Now, all of this doesn't mean that everyone in the U.S. agrees or are all on the same page, but it does mean that there is a general sense of what we should and what we should not do, that in general we have a, na a national conscience. Uh, many illustrations of this. Two more things about the conscience, and then I'm going to move, move on. When there is a strong collective conscience about something, anything, in other words, when there's consensus about an issue, you know what's true? It's always true with this. You don't have to have a lot of rules and restrictions when you have a collective consciousness. Now, hear, hear me on this, think this through. This is gonna be important. It's gonna affect you in the next couple of years, particularly. The best example I can give of this is a healthy marriage. In a healthy marriage, there aren't a whole lot of rules. In other words, you don't wake up with your mate, mate and sit down in the morning at the coffee table and go, now, I just wanna make sure before we go do what we gotta to do today that we're gonna stay faithful, we're not going, to, you know, and we don't have this checklist of what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. We know what we're supposed to do. And it's taken for granted that we're just supposed to do it. There's a sense of what is right. There's a sense of what is wrong. And in a healthy relationship, you naturally buy into that because you want it to remain healthy. In a healthy community of people, you don't have to have a lot of rules. I don't know if you know that about here at Leesburg, but we don't have, like other churches, big policies and long bylaws. We only have to have what we have to have in order to, to be recognized uh, as an institution uh, for our benefit of uh, pr propagating the gospel. Uh, for, for, but we don't have a lot of rules here. For, for example, when we put our announcements on the screen, you have never sat in this building, ever, and the announcement come up on the screen, oh, by the way, we want to remind you that when you leave today, please don't take the nursery TV with you. <laughs> We're going to make an assumption that you know that is wrong. Okay? Because we have a collective conscience about right and, and what is wrong. One of the reasons that our legal system is so complex and is more so each day is because our national conscience is eroding big time. Big time. And the only way to shore up behavior if you have no collective conscience, the only way to shore it up, like for instance, we're seeing every day in the news where we're telling people not to shoot other people, the only, if you don't have a collective conscience on that, the only thing you can do is put laws into effect that puts the opportunity of whatever that is out of their hand. Gun laws. See? The problem is, if you take this idea down the road for a while, what you end up with is that right and wrong, or morality, is now determined by the courts rather than the human heart. This is a big deal for us as Christ followers. Now, the other thing about a conscience that you need to know is this, is that a conscience, to have one, has to be informed. It has to be informed, which is part of what our job is here. It's our, it's our spiritual responsibility. See, the reason that we have a high cringe factor about throwing a bunch of garbage out the window is because somebody taught us that. Somebody taught you that. If you have children, you know that that's something, along with many other things, that you have to teach them when they're very little so they get into the... Hip a uh, habit of doing the things that we feel are consciously right or correct. So while there is this inherent sense about some things of right and wrong, we still have to teach the details to inform our conscience on how to carry that out. Right? Let me show you a quick illustration of this from the Bible. And it's going to be the last Bible reference 
that I directly make, but it's a big one. Romans chapter 2, Paul is talking about how non-Jews, Gentiles, who did not have the law, they didn't have access, they didn't learn it, they didn't have the Ten Commandments, they didn't grow up learning that. He makes a statement about what's in their hearts automatically that God innately puts in every human being and how that works beside God's law. This is very interesting to me. See, God's law to the Jews was the way of informing their conscience of what they kind of innately knew, but they didn't know how to carry it out. So everyone kind of knows basically right and wrong, and God says, I want to give you some details and more info on how to do that uh, in a better way. So that, that's what he's addressing. So listen to these verses, verse 14. Indeed, he writes, when Gentiles who do not have the law, the Ten Commandments and so forth, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. Let it sink in. He says Gentiles who don't even have the Ten Commandments do things that are also included in the Ten Commandments, not because they've been taught them, but because they know in their heart there's just some things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't steal your neighbor's chicken. You shouldn't sleep with your neighbor's wife, right? You kind of, those kind of things you just, you know. Well, how do you know them? Well, God has created us in his image. That's how you know some of those things. Verse 15. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. That's the conscious part. He goes on. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now, uh, now even defending them. So the conscience takes whatever information that you put in there and it accuses you and says you shouldn't do that or it defends you and says, okay, that's all, that's all right to do that. Based on that general sense of right and wrong that people are born with, along with whatever has informed the conscience to support that. I hope I haven't lost you because this is important. It really is. Now, every, and here's why. Every single one of you in this room has an informed conscience. We all do. So in that regard, we're, we're without excuse. You have been taught beyond the basic right and wrong, things that you should and should not be doing, and it has shaped your conscience. It has shaped your family conscience. It has shaped our community conscience. It has shaped the conscience of this church. It has shaped the conscience of our nation, ultimately, if you put us all collectively together. Now, all of that to ask a question. So what has then informed our national conscience that we have today? What has made America the greatest country on earth, comparatively speaking? What was it that originally informed our national conscience that people are so attracted to that they desire to come here from every corner of the world? What is it? And the answer to that question is, there is a sense of personal and corporate accountability, hear me, to God our Creator. That's how it started. That's what shaped our national conscience. That's how our national conscience was originally informed. I want to give you a couple of examples of this. Now, I, I want to make this really clear what I'm about to say, because I've, been, I've made this statement before and I've been... been you know, racked about it. But so listen, I'm not arguing, nor would I ever argue, that our founding fathers of the United States of America were all Christ follower Christians. Okay? I'm not arguing that. Or that all believed the same theology about God, or all revered the Bible as being the authority of God I, and took it seriously. I'm not arguing that point. I don't know that. I've read. Little on both, okay, as far as history. But what I am arguing, and I'm willing to go to, 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 the, to the mat over, is that there was, in the lives of the individuals of our founding fathers, a sense of personal and national accountability to God that has, in a huge way, shaped and formed our national view of what we should and should not do. What should and should not be right. I want you to listen to something for a minute, which can prove this point. And I could go on and on. I don't have time. So bear with me. I'm going to give you a sentence, the second sentence from the Declaration of Independence. And I want you to keep in mind what I just said to you, okay? Here it is. 
We hold, you've heard this, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Look at that, self-evident. There's no debate because it just is. It's self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by who? The government? No. The creator. By their creator with certain unalienable rights. And here are some of those rights that overflowed of the assumption that everyone is created equal and valued in God's eyes. That among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the Declaration, Declaration of Independence, second sentence. Now, this is huge. Stay with me. Here's how our founding fathers viewed our world. We're going to start a nation. In fact, we're going to break off from England, and we ought to do so because of the way that God has designed mankind, and we have not been able to act in such a way that reflects how God has made us. Now, obviously, that was not the only reason behind the Revolutionary War. It's more complex than that. But the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence invokes our Creator and invites the presence of God on the basis of what we should and should not do as human beings. Now, of course, the hypocrisy, but stay with me on this, because this is where I always get pushed back when I talk these things. The hypocrisy of the revolution, of course, was slavery. But hear me on this. Very soon after this, this same terminology that these guys came up with is what was used to leverage the abolition movement to say, whoa, if God created everyone equal, then we got to adjust. We can't have it both ways. We, we got to hold ourselves in check. And this was the idea that was used throughout the Civil War. And eventually, slavery was done away with in England and in the United States. But it was this language that was used to get that done. There was never any question about, no matter how they were living their personal lives, there was never any question about who, that, that we are accountable to God. None. It was a collective consciousness. It's just how... How's it going to work out? That was the question. Then there was this incredible speech that I learned as a kid, I hope you did too, called the Gettysburg Address, in which Abraham Lincoln introduced two words, and it was the real first public use of this phrase, and we've heard it said hundreds of times. And here's the quote. He said that we, we here highly resolve that these dead who have died in battle shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God. Abraham Lincoln, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. Under God. What does that mean? What did he have in, what was his intent? Abraham Lincoln viewed our nation as a nation under and accountable to God. And he was not afraid to use that imagery as he talks about political issues. Not afraid. Now, he says we're a nation under God. Now, here's, the, here's what also he had in his mind. Because if you read the whole thing, you get this very easily in other things that he wrote. He's not saying we get it right every time. And, and you know, at that time, we're having a civil war because we don't get it right every time. But nobody is arguing at the end of the day that we are not accountable to God for our decisions. That's what he's saying. Then, it didn't stop there. Then in the 1950s, that little phrase, under God, was lifted out of that speech and placed in our Pledge of Allegiance. Right? Some of you can actually remember this. So now we are one nation under God declaring that we view God as the one who oversees our nation. Now, do we all agree about God? No. Do we all believe the same thing about the Bible? No. It's actually much broader than that. There is an acknowledgement here. This is important. There is an acknowledgement that there is gratitude and accountability to God. Period. Then in 1956, our country got a new motto. This is interesting. Got a new motto. 
1956, the 84th Congress declared that we would have a new motto. President Eisenhower signed it into law on July the 30th, 1956, and the new national motto was this, In God We Trust. National motto, In God We Trust. Print it on our currency. In God We Trust. And today... In our culture, the question is, what in the world were they thinking? You want to know what they were thinking? In God, we trust. That's what they were thinking. We trust in God. And even though it's our motto, it's our national motto, we're not allowed to say it in public today. I guess you can rub your coins. I don't know. It's crazy. But why is that? What has happened? We have drifted so far away, friends, from God talk politically and God talk in our nation that now it seems almost strange and weird. Our conscience is changing. And we don't allow them to do that. Why? Because God, in terms of gratitude and accountability too, has over time been pushed further and further and further aside and out of sight, out of mind. Now, you may know this. We just had a presidential election. This has always been intriguing to me. Whenever we have a new president that is elected at his inauguration, or hers, potentially, the president makes an oath with their hand on the Bible. The president, right? And ends that oath with what words? So help me... God. So help me God. Now the reason that I mention that, you might say, well, so what? What's the big deal? The reason that's a big deal is because technically, foundationally, our national conscience, our national shoulds and should nots is very closely tied to the existence and the presence of God which is what has made our country attractive to the world. And the further we distance ourselves from God politically, nationally, and publicly, the further we get away from our national sense of gratitude and accountability to God. See, the key is the further we get away from those things, and here's what I'm propagating to you today, the further we push that aside, something has to take its place. Nothing stays void. Something fills the hole. We're living in that time right now. So the debate right now and what's going on behind the scenes really isn't about conservative versus not so conservative and rich versus not so rich. We can get mad about those things. We can split friendships and families up over those issues if we choose. But the real debate is this. The two groups of people that the majority are lining up behind are these two groups. Don't forget this. Sammy Harris said it. In 2021, the grateful and the accountable versus the ungrateful and the unaccountable. That's the two groups we have lining up today. It's the grateful and accountable that says, as odd as it may sound, I still give credit for God for what goes on in my life. I may not live up to it perfectly, but I give him credit for what goes on in my life and our nation. And I still feel like, even though I fall short, I still feel like that personally and nationally, we are accountable to God. And then there's the other group. Now stay with me. There's the other group that says, I'm not grateful to God. I'm not sure really who I'm grateful to. I guess I'm grateful to myself. As bad as that sounds, I'm not accountable to God. I'm only accountable to me. Right? Here's my point of this. You take God out of the accountability uh, system, and what you end up with is no accountability, and we're seeing the result today. Violence, confusion, suicide, hopelessness, despair, like we have never seen in the history of the United States. And the issue is, is it going to be, here's the challenge, in God we trust or in us we trust? That's where the issue is going to land. What's this going to be? That is the fundamental debate that is happening in this land right now. And everything else 
is hinging on that. Now, I want you to understand, and I'm, I'm pretty close here, that I get the whole separation of church and state thing and how that has been applied in some screwy ways, I might add. I understand all that, but here's what I also understand, and I'm going to wrap this up. Here, here's the question that we have got to answer as Christ followers. This is, the, this is the question that we have to answer as a nation. If, if our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is tied to that there is a God who gave everyone that privilege and that right, which is how our country got started, you can debate it all you want, it's there, you can read it for yourself, that because God created you equal with the person today who's on your left and on your right, you have a right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness, and we have to, we ha and we have to create a system that allows those things to happen. If those rights are tied to a creator God, and we remove the creator God from the conversation like we're doing presently, then here's my question. Then what is the basis in the future for our freedom to pursue life, liberty, and happiness? What's our basis for that? If the basis of the pursuit is removed from the dialogue, what's the new basis? Where's it, where it going to land? What is the protection for those things? What is the standard for those things? What is the determining factor for what's right and what's wrong? What gives us the right for those things? See, because God has informed our conscience as a nation, we've been able to do some amazing things as a country. We've offered minorities freedom. That's a conscience issue. We've, we've, we've done the same thing with women's rights. We've done the same thing with children. And, we're, and we could continue to do the same thing. But what happens if we remove the basis that informed our conscience for the pursuit of life, liberty, and, and happiness. What do we do as a nation with the second sentence of the Declaration? What are we going to do with it? Because here's what you have to do if we're going to stay on the path that one. You've got to replace it with something. Because we're not practicing it. You have to replace it. And my question is, is what is it going to be? What's it going to be? My recommendation is that until we have a good answer for that, which we're not going to have, there is no better answer, I think it's very dangerous. No matter what we believe or disagree or agree about God and His church and the Bible, I think it's very dangerous to dismiss God and think somehow God is going to be replaced with something that's going to equally be protective of what has given us the right and privilege to sit in this room today. And I think we're kidding ourselves. Now, this is where I, I have really struggled getting ready for today because I have no application for this message whatsoever. I'm just being honest with you. But I did want to do this. I just wanted to challenge you because this Sunday fell on the 4th. And as you look today and you go home and you turn on your TV or in your community and hopefully you'll come back and share with us tonight, as you look at 4th of July festivities, I want you to do that through new eyes, different eyes. And I want you to look and just notice who is and who is not afraid to say, you know what, we're still accountable to God. You know what, we owe our gratitude to God. You just, you listen. You listen to the tone. You listen to the speeches. You listen to what's being said. You listen to the newscasters. And I want to tell you, you will notice, conspicuously notice, what is absent at a time when we need it more than we've ever needed it in the history of our nation. That's what you're going to find out. And we've got to quit laughing about it. It's not a joke. It's a serious time for us. And it begins with you, and it begins with me. We need our, our Creator to divinely intervene more than He ever has. And we've never been a nation that's asked for it less. You know, 76 times in the New Testament, <clears throat> it speaks of the freedom that we have in Christ. In John 8, 32... Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
When Jesus stood before Pilate in John chapter 18 and made accusations of him to def- of Jesus to defend who Jesus was, Jesus said, "Hey, I was born and I came to testify to the truth." Do you remember what Pilate said back to Jesus? He said, well, what is truth? That's where our country's at right now. What is truth? Friends, I love you. I love our nation. I feel very privileged to be in a Kentuckian and to be here worshiping with you today. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's fragile. It's fragile. Don't take it for granted. This ought to be the reminder of the sacrifice and price that has to be paid. For your independence and for mine, the freedom that we have expressed in Christ through His body, Through his blood. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I
I stumbled through the door, I was addicted, could barely take a seat, my life in pieces, no one to blame but me, nothing but shame on me. The preacher spoke the word, it felt like good news, I couldn't help myself, I had to run to you, you, you took, took the blame, blame for me. Shame on me Now I'm alive For the first time Like my heart just started Beating inside my chest And it's all Cause of Jesus My chains are gone Lord has paid my debt I'm alive My life has changed All the joy I feel At the sound of your name Jesus Jesus I can shout it all day No longer just a beggar Struggling to find bread A sinner saved by grace I've been born again More than a dead pain You picked me out of the grave Now I'm alive to open my eyes thank you god for your mercy and your blessings in my life for your patience and my family every day i get to open my eyes now i'm alive for the first time my heart just started beating inside my chest Thank you so much for coming. Hope you come tonight.